Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Grip Lock preview for D-Glow, the Discraft Great Lakes Open, uh, happening in Michigan. This is Discraft's kind of home event. The if toboggan you course. At the toboggan course. If we're looking at the course, pretty much the exact same Perfect for as... a slip and slide. Yes, true. That's a same teams running it too. Yeah. Will we see a slip and slide? Hole one. Just... Bring back the bold prediction. Yeah. Will we see a slip and slide? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, bold my bold prediction is we're gonna see a slip and slide. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, might be a little cooler though. It's, it is. it's kind of been a cool week. We'll talk about the weather here in a second. Um, but we got the toboggan course is basically the exact same as last year. The since it's a four round event, there will be a few times where you know you're in A pin for this round, B pin for the other round, stuff like that. Really, the only changes was it looked like hole 18 was like 15 feet shorter, and hole that one they the took out the B pin. It's just one pin, but overall the course is the same yeah i looked at the ob and stuff now this is from the caddy book so sometimes you'll look at the caddy book and people will be like oh no this whole play is way different they moved the ob 15 feet closer and it's right. like well the caddy book doesn't show that so there could be more drastic changes but this is just based on the caddy book nothing significant no new holes or anything like that so what that does allow us to do is we can actually dive a little bit deeper because disc golf events uh courses change pretty much every year so a lot of times you look at the past player performance and stuff like that and it's like that all means nothing um this time around i think it does mean a little something but am, am i silly for thinking that did, did paul shoot 18 under at d-glow he did that was the that was his best 18 under round in my opinion not on the list there Best rounds at D-Glow. Oh, yeah, you're right. So I'm, I'm, oh. I'm not going to say that Edwin missed that. Like Maybe I'm, maybe the course has changed. That's what I'm saying. I think that was, I'm missing that something. That was back in like 2019, 19, 18. I think. I think it was 19 or 18. Um, yeah, it was probably 18. No, was he 40. with Innova or was he with Discraft? He shot 40 under that year. Oh, he was definitely with Discraft. Okay, so then it was, it was probably well, 2019. He was wearing that pink Nike polo. Did he wear that with Innova That's or Discraft? I don't know. That, that might have been Innova. It might have been an Innova round. And the whole there was holes that were different. So this is yeah. probably just this current. Actually, course. they kind of adjusted the pars too, didn't they? They did. Yeah. No, that's Waco. Oh, that's Waco. That's a different. Paul shot 1800 at several different places. Yeah, just getting confused the 1800 um, this year. Anyways, weather looks gorgeous on Thursday, gorgeous on Sunday, rain Friday, Saturday in the forecast. The rain's also going to bring in a cold front. So. Mm. On Thursday, you're looking at like 85 degrees. On Sunday, I think it was like in the 60s. Wow. So pretty drastic you difference. You see a lot of rain at that course. I feel like it's not normally, not. and it doesn't look like it's going to be like oh rain delay or like storm delay type. It looks like just rain showers Factor. coming through. Um, and then Sunday is going to be the windiest of all the days, but it's still not. We're not yeah. talking crazy wind. Yeah. So should be pretty scorable out there overall. It is going to be important for players to get off to a good start on Thursday, take advantage of those conditions, so the best conditions they're going to have all week. But four rounds of this course, you know, it's just, it is what it is. So I think that one of the most important stats that Edwin provided for us is the past player performance here, given that it is a very similar course. And really, I want to focus on number one on this list, Eagle McMahon. Three times played here. His average score at 29.3 under par. His top finish winning it back in 2021 and in 2020. Um, back to back there. He's also one of only two players to have finished inside the top 10 every start out here. The other player being Ricky Wysocki. So Eagle, though, obviously this season's a little bit different than Eagle previous seasons. Yeah. Do all of these stats make you think, oh, here we go, Eagles in contention, or are you still hesitant with what we've been seeing out of them? Um, I think it tells me that, like, oh, this would be a, a really fun place for kind of like a happy ending to Eagles season, you know, where he does, like, get that win, and it's a huge confidence boost, and I think that would be a really, I think the people would really get behind him, and that'd be a fun narrative to track down, but the way he's been playing, it doesn't lead me to believe that um, to, yeah, I'm not going to say he's like, oh, a, a favorite for the podium, but I definitely like him in the top 10 here, and it wouldn't surprise me if he can get a little bit of momentum going. I think he's slowly, slowly kind of building up that mental game and, and kind of figuring things out. I think Worlds is a big part of that for him. And, um, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't be shocked to see a good finish out of him, but I'm not ready to call him one of the favorites. Yeah, I, I would, I'm in the same boat, mainly because I think this course is going to suit a lot of players. But, I mean, even he won it, like I said, 2020, 2021. He came in yeah. second last year to Simon. He, yeah. He's just kind of been around yeah. all the time. But we are looking at a different eagle in, the, in, in between the years, mm -hmm. realistically. It seems like physically he's back. It just seems like mentally he doesn't believe he's back all the way. Like, he's trying to c c still convince himself like I can play at the level hurdle. I've been able to. And that's the biggest hurdle when you get injured a lot of times isn't yeah. even recovering from the injury. A lot of times it's convincing yourself you're recovered from the injury and being able to trust your body again. I think that's kind of what Eagle's been going through. Right. With that being said, he's shown some great improvement here recently. Um, even like Worlds, he had a very solid performance at Worlds. I, I could definitely see him getting in the mix here. 
Um, I really like him for top 10. I think that that's a very solid thing. I even like him for top five. I don't believe I put him in my top three, so I don't like him that much, apparently. But um, it won't surprise me. Yeah. Um, I think this could be one of those events where Eagle could get in the mix, and I think that'll get people really excited. Um, one player who's missing from this past player performance list, and I, I don't know, I need I should have asked Edwin, because I don't know if it's just maybe he hasn't played the event enough times, is Simon Lazat, last year's winner. Um, he went back and forth with Eagle out here. So, what do you like from Simon? You know, obviously, Music City Open winner this year. Um, he when he's on, he's on. When he's off, he's off. He seemed pretty decently. He played decent at, at Worlds overall. What do you think for him at D Club? Yeah, um, it's you know it's hard to predict a streaky player. It's kind of a losing game, and Simon is one of those guys that just pops in and out randomly. I think he has had some decent finishes. He played all right at Worlds, but at the end of the day, I, I don't know that I've seen enough this season to really. I don't know if he's going to have one of those surges. I mean, I'm never surprised once he gets going. Um, he, he's very tough to stop, so I'm never surprised to see him win in the later half of the season. I, I, I like him really, at, you know, especially here and um, MVP Open as the season comes to a close. But I, I just like even being a streaky player, I haven't seen enough from him to to really be like having him on my radar a ton. Um, as a defending champ, you know we've already seen him defend one tournament this year at Music City, and you know they don't have a guitar up for prize here, so that I, is true. I, uh, that's a different level of motivation. So I, I'm not I'm not super high on him. There's just too many other guys that are playing really well right now that it's tough for me to just squeeze him into my top three. The the reason I I, I really do like Simon out here is I think Simon is a vibes guy. I think a lot of He's it is just guy. he when he feels good he plays good, um, and I get good the feeling that that he just really likes this course. Not maybe not necessarily the design or anything like that. I get the feeling that his game he just feels really confident on this course, um, and it makes sense. I mean, we're if we're looking at the average feet per par stroke, it's the third longest on uh, tour. Yeah. Other ones being Glendivere East and Swinson Park, uh, the California courses, golf courses are the only ones that beat it out. Um, and yeah, I just I like Simon out here. I think that you know it's really going to play well to his game. It all is obviously going to come down to his putting. I think he's going to throw the disc very well. Yeah. But um, no, I really like his chances. I, in my okay. head, I think he's one of, if not the favorite, coming into this event. For one me. thing to remember about this course is that average feet per par is very inflated because there's a lot of very downhill holes on this course. That's true. There is also uphill, so I'd, I'd be curious to see how it stacks up, but. You're gonna see hole one, for example, is probably what over 500 feet or close to it. I think it's only like 395. Is it really only that far? Maybe it's that much of a right angle that it does. I think it's that, that much of a right but angle. I know there are a few holes there that I, that look like they play longer than they are because of the teeing off on the toboggan hills. 560. Okay, thank there you. you. I was like, dang, if that's only 395. Okay, so yeah, there there are gonna be. Where holes. did 395 come from? Because that was a very specific guess. I don't know. I think that might be New London's first hole. It is. Okay. That's not what I was thinking, but it is um, also. But There's yeah. a hole out there that's 395. There is a, a number of holes like that that I think are obviously they don't play that far, but yes. um, so I'd be curious to know how much that affects into it because like point. you think about Glendevere and, and Swenson, like they're much more level courses. They're and just they're, long, and they're just that long. Whereas yeah, Toboggan, you do get a weird elevation mix, but in regardless of that, it, it is a course where the further throwers do can take advantage because usually the landing zones are pretty accessible for a long amount of distance. It's not like playing at New London, for example, like we saw recently, you got you can get certain distance and then sometimes you just don't want to get any further than that really to get yourself out of position. Um, I think at this course there's there's large landing zones to where you can be 80 feet in front of everybody else and you are actually in a better spot you're just closer to your target so i i do think that there will be an advantage for the big throwers at this course now i gotta talk about past player performance list here number two on this list is a pretty shocking member kevin yeah. jones five events out here average score of 24.6 his best finish is two um I believe Ricky and Kevin Jones are the top players historically to not win out here. Obviously, Kevin Jones, the more surprise out of those two on that list. I mean, what would it mean for Kevin in his season if he were to come out here and get a win? It'd be huge because he's slowly picking up some steam. Ever since he joined Innova, I mean, he's had some great finishes. And I, I don't know how many people are paying attention to that. Um, I think he really needs to cement himself into one of these events, at least like get himself in the mix and really put himself in front of people. But he has been playing great disc golf since he since he left Prodigy. And um, once again, I don't I don't think he's going to be a guy that's going to uh, contend and win this tournament. But it wouldn't surprise me to see him sneak onto a lead card late in the late in the rounds. And um, you know, clearly he has a good history and he is playing great golf right now. Yeah, no, you do. 
I, I like, I mean, obviously you have to like him based on the past player performance. I agree. I don't really like him to win per se, especially being a four round event. There's just some guys who have crazy consistency um, that it's just going to be tough to overcome, but it would be huge for him. I think that a lot of the play, uh, we obviously, Kayla Visca did a whole rant on, you know, Prodigy getting negative press when players do well and stuff. But I think a lot of the play we're seeing from Kevin, it might be attributed to, oh, he changed plastic and of a superior. I think it's really, he's playing freer. Mm -hmm. He went from a situation where obviously something wasn't working out because he got dropped mid-season. So that's not something that, like, can't, it could have been. But I would imagine that's not something that came out of the blue to Kevin. I would assume he knew there's some type of something going on behind the scenes. So, it could also be, you know, he's back to a lot of the old stuff he was throwing pre prodigy because when he was with Prodiscus, he was bombing bosses and had a bunch of Innova stuff in his back. So mm -hmm. there's also the like getting back to, you know, some sentimental discs that you just, you haven't misaligned with this disc. It feels like in ages because you haven't thrown it in ages. So you're remembering some of the good. Um, so I think mentally he's just playing a lot freer, which is allowing his best game to come forward. I still don't know if Kevin Jones at his best in today's field is winning yeah but i do think kevin jones at his best in today's field is a top 10 top five so yeah. I, I could definitely see him getting himself in the mix and who knows maybe he has a late round surge and he has a chance to to take one down it would be incredible um for his career it would also be incredible for innova i think that would be a really big thing of like you know the marketing they could do from that if they choose it it wouldn't be great for prodigy no um but <laughs> it'd be good for pretty much everyone else in the situation yeah it seems like right now no matter how things spin towards prodigy it always puts them in a negative light yeah that's <laughs> gotta be very fresh the guy wins the guy they used to have wins like it doesn't matter <laughs> yeah um the other guys obviously we just talked about ricky briefly i do i i i'm surprised ricky's never won out here with how good he's played out here before um but when i think of d glow for some reason, Ricky's not one of the guys that like it clicks, and I'm like, oh, this course really makes sense for yeah, him per se. Yeah. Um, so I think that just a, is more of an attribute of like Ricky's just been that good for so long that it really doesn't matter the course. Ricky's going to be solid, but this is one of the courses that gives people advantages. The next player on the list I want to talk about that I do think has an advantage out here, just their play style wise, it does click in my head. It does make sense. Is uh, Calvin Heimberg? He makes a lot of sense out here. Obviously, won it in 2022. Had a little bit of an up and down year. I actually had to remind myself he's won twice this year yeah. um, because I forgot that. Yeah. Um, cool. He, you know, had a solid performance at Worlds. So like he is playing fine. He's playing solid. This could, I mean, if he picks up a third win here, he'd probably be having what the like third or fourth best season. You know, him and yeah. AB would probably be kind of neck and neck in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, so this could be a big weekend for Calvin in general, especially as he heads into more well, and more him tournaments. And AB would not be neck and neck. Does AB? AB has how much, does he have five wins? Four, I thought. It's just four. But Calvin's has more. We had to look this. We got to look this up. We do this to ourselves. I, I don't. I think that you're confusing uh, Gannon and AB. It might just be four. I know he went back to back. He won, he won chess, chess, and then he went. And then back he won to back. Texas State's played again. And then he won one more. And then he won Des Moines. Yeah, so just is four. So it's just four. So yeah, it would put him. It he put also right won on the long drive competition at Worlds. That's Ooh. on his PGA. Ooh. Does that count as a PDGA win? It's a C tier. It probably does. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, that is funny. Inflate but no, it's just four. So it would get him one closer to to AB. But yeah, I, I don't know. It'd just be a big, big win for Calvin in general, and I, I definitely could see it happen. Um, I, I like him at this course. But what do you think? Is there anything in particular you have your eyes on? Of like, if we see this out of Calvin in round one, if this part of his game's clicking, I really like him. Or is it just we'll see what happens? I think if we just see more of the same, you know, because at Worlds, realistically, he just kind of got caught behind, like a lot of good players did, to where Isaac was commanding things and they were trying to get too aggressive at Ivy, and it just wasn't panning out. Um, but realistically, he was playing pretty well. I was throwing the disc pretty well. Putt looked okay. Um, didn't look as shaky as it's been in recent times. Um, I do think that if he plays his game the way he has been, given his history and, and his success navigating this course, I think he'll be right in the mix. And I think he's a great chance to win this tournament. I think this this feels like a right spot for Calvin to get a win. No, I would agree. I think, though, what I'm looking for out of Calvin is there's going to be a few important testers in round one that he needs to make, in my opinion. I think if he can get like his confidence flowing in round one, hit a few 
few of those like 25 to 40 footers, like that little that range. It can get a little dicey. Maybe not outside the circle per se. So maybe like 25 to 35, right at that like circle's edge. Hit a few of those to just where and like for birdie, some momentum building putts to where he gets where he feels like he has a full head of steam. I think that could be something where it could be really important. I think round one is going to be really crucial for Calvin because I think that if he gets behind him round one, it could be a, a more classic Calvin performance where I think him and Ricky can be similar sometimes where they will end up on the podium, mm -hmm. but they were never really in it. Right. And it's like, well, yeah, he came in third, but he came in third because he was on chase card and yeah. like chase. He was never, he never had a shot at chasing down the lead. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's gonna be important for him to get in a good position round one. Now, this next player has won every Elite Plus event, I believe, up to this point this year. Gannon Burr, he when he was in here was talking about Ivy and how he thought Ivy compared to Toboggan somewhat, and how Toboggan's a course that he feels like he really should be one of the best players in the world at. Like he really loves that course, but he's played it really bad last year, and that he's for sure winning this event. Talked a lot of confidence when he was in here about it. He's played this event three times. His average score of this event is only 15 under, putting him at 15th on pass player performance. Hearing him talk and then seeing the pass player performance stats really got me confused there because I agree with what he was saying. This does feel like a course that should be Gannon Burr's bread and butter. This does feel like a spot where he could really, you know, put the pedal to the metal and win by eight strokes. But statistics say historically that hasn't been the case. Do you think this is one of those situations where? The stats don't matter, or is there something there? Yeah, I don't know. I my gut just tells me to ignore the stats on this one, given the season he's had. It's, it you know, this season is different, and you know we'll probably talk about the other guy, the Bob Misslist next. But I think he like as good as Gannon has been in past years. This has been a different level of Gannon. So I I. I I don't. I, there might be something there because it is. It is definitely odd, but I'm not willing to go there at this point. If there's another shaky finish, then I'm gonna, I might have to look a little closer. Yeah. No. I'm willing to go. I'm willing to say there is something with this course, um, and I'm willing to say that there is something to these stats. And so that's why I'm not picking him to win. What only is picking him in my top three. What is it to this course? Stats. But why? Well, that's why he's only in my top three. Okay. I'm not. He's, I'm not picking him to win. I'm not picking him to win either. But I'm just not taking him out of my top three. Yeah. Because there's there's something to this course. There's something. So he, he's just top three guy this week. I'm not I'm a dying to know what it is. I don't know. No, the only thing that can make sense to me Too that many can click hills is like rollaways, man. Is Can't is there it. something where? he gets baited a time or two into something he shouldn't because it is odd his top finish is 10th like there's got to be something there but it just none of it it doesn't pass the eye test yeah. eye test says he should be dominant this course maybe it's something where it brings in too many other people that well, also it's also a tough one too i'd be curious you know maybe it's he's, elevation he's changes. only he's only played three times and i'd be curious to know what those three finishing scores were like maybe one of them just was just really bad and he had a nagging injury and, and it's just gotten out of hand because he he finished well, like his top finish far. is 10th though yeah, yeah, that's that's that's, that's that the other true. Thing. That is true. Because if you look at the people ahead, like the top six, Paul, Calvin, Corey, Ricky, Kevin Jones, Eagle, it's all first and second, so top finish. Yeah. Um, and like Paul and Eagle both won it back to back. So I don't know. The other player, obviously, on this list we got to talk about. The last one is Anthony Barella. Um, this yeah. is a similar situation where we've seen it before, where I've used the stat argument of like, well, statistically, A B hasn't been good here. Sometimes it doesn't. This is one where I'm not using that argument because it's similar to to Gannon, where like. It doesn't click like Northwoods clicks, right? Where I see AB going to Northwood, I'm like, it makes sense. While sati why statistically he struggled at this course before, like that checks out of my head. Yeah. This is one where it just doesn't check well, out. The only thing I can think of, maybe for both players, is just the elevation changes. Maybe it's just something that like they don't have. If it's like what I'm about to say, they don't have angle control. Of course, they have angle control. I don't know. Yeah, I but think, I, I think that this, especially with AB and the season he's having over previous seasons, this one has a little bit of. In his top finish is still eighth. He still came in the top ten. This one has a little bit of a, a fraud stat watch. Not a fraud stat in that it's fake, but fraud stat in that it's misleading. Yeah, Gannon's a weird one, but I think, yeah, AB's just kind of been low-hanging fruit for that stat all year because this has just been the first season he's really emerged. So you're going to see a lot of weird finishes like that at events. And you're right, it doesn't. it's not like that makes sense for this event. There's a, he has every chance to win this one. Yeah, no, I really like him out here, too. Is there any other players you have your eyes on going into this week? Mm, not really in particular. I think yeah, I think you mentioned, like I think Eagle and, and KJ are probably the two that are the most interesting to watch and Simon really like that trio is probably the most unpredictable and interesting uh, people that could steal a win here but I think that really covers my, the basis Ezra Robinson still somebody that we're waiting to maybe see if they'll get a win this year still playing good golf um, 
so that that's always one to look at as well. Yeah, the other, the one player I want to bring up is Chris Dickerson. I think he had a podium finish here last year. Was in the mix. Um, which, you know, I think this is a course you don't necessarily think of him. I went, I look, I look back, I think he came in 11th in 2023 or 2022. Um, it was 2022, he came in like 11th. So he's played solid out here. Um, you know, I've been picking Chris Dickerson as someone to watch for like a month and a half now. I think he might win USDGC. I like him for USDGC too, but, you know, I definitely. There is something about like placement on this course and stuff. And when you go placement, Chris Dickerson always comes to mind. And the other player, Isaac Robinson, obviously comes to mind. Fresh off of Worlds, that can affect him one of two ways. It can either affect him of like, I'm smoking hot right now, both looks and on the course, and like I can't mess up. Or I just won a world championship. I, it's hard for me to care about what I'm doing. I out think here. it's tough to win right after Worlds, putting all that effort in over five days. And, and you know, he's had the week off, so who knows? He's, you know, I'm sure his game is still intact. But yeah, that that's that is always fascinating to see how the how the world champ will react. Yeah, so it's more uh, Chris Dickerson's on my radar. I'm expecting good performance out of him. Isaac's on my radar because I'm just he's gonna be an interesting one just to see where he ends up, mm -hmm. um, just to see how he reacts. Now over on FPO, Owen Scoggins is the returning champ here and just beat Kristen Tatar at the CCR Open last weekend yeah what do you think right. of her chances to repeat um i think they're pretty solid um although i think the second half of the season uh has been a little disappointing for her um these the past few weekends she's been playing i i you know it, it's always tough with own because you're never sure like where when her game is going to kind of fail her as far as her distance and things like that i know there were definitely some struggles and concerns for her at worlds especially at ivy um but she's you know like you mentioned she's the returning champ so the, i think i think she has a great chance to challenge i think um you know kristen probably still has that pressure on her right now to tr keep collecting wins and try and build her season up and and really cement it as something solid because she is lacking some of the majors that she was able to win last year obviously but i think uh i think own is, is gonna be right there to challenge her no i really like Own this weekend i think you know having the she won it last year she believes she can just beating kristen in michigan um last weekend like you don't really have that uh, kristen uh, you know, actually, before I talk, let me ask you this. Is Kristen still your favorite to win this weekend? Do you still think she's the one to beat? Um, yes, but I it used to be like I had it. I felt it was a certainty. Now it's kind of gotten to the point where I've always felt the rest of the FPO field is, or at least that next category of players that can win, which is it's kind of a roll the dice and i just feel like she's slightly the best odds it's definitely not the way it used to feel where i felt like it was 70 percent kristen 30 percent anyone else now it's maybe more like 60 percent kristen maybe 55 percent kristen and then the rest of the field it, it's definitely become a little more uncertain for me she's she just looked shaky it, it just hasn't been very impressive yeah no i'm on the same page kristen i actually didn't pick kristen to win this event um in my top three i i tried not to i wrote down something else and i quickly scratched it out no yeah i, just I couldn't didn't do it i think that she's on a little bit of a cold streak right now obviously statistically she it's only been like an she event played a good so, back but, half of worlds though um, i, I bought she myself just, in on it i just couldn't she, she had several chances to get something going. I never really saw her get it going. And I feel like what it's doing more than anything is the field doesn't have that fear of Kristen. Yeah. Like you don't have the Kristen effect anymore nearly as much because like she's human, mm -hmm. like especially this year, she feels very beatable, very human. And when a player feels like that, like part of what made Kristen so effective last year is at least I thought this was the case. Um, it might not have been, but it felt like a lot of the reason FPO, several FPO players were messing up was Kristen was right there. Yeah. And it was like, well, they're messing up because they know, like, I can't mess up or Kristen's going to take it. I don't feel that pressure anymore. I don't feel like, oh, if Evelina misses this putt, Kristen's going to run through the wide open door. It's like, I, I just don't feel that same dominant effect from her right now. Yeah. Um, could she easily get it back? Yeah, there's plenty of golf left. She could win out, and then, you know, she'd be the talk of the town. But I don't see it. I actually really like Own Scoggins. Own Scoggins, who I'm going to end up picking to win yeah, this okay. event. But um, I really like Own out here. I think she's going to have a lot of confidence against Kristen. Is there any other players you have your eyes on coming into this weekend? Uh, yeah, I like Haley King out here. Some good finishes historically. Um, and then also Cat Merch. Interested to see what she does following up uh, the world's performance keep an eye on her yeah i think when you have distance you got to also bring in holland hanley and ella hansen i think both of them will be interesting yeah. to watch obviously we talk about them in the same breath holland has 
you know, become the much more dominant player of those two. Um, but as soon as distance gets on the radar, I think both of their names just have to be brought up because like this is a distance course to a certain extent, not to the extent where own isn't going to be able to compete because it's still landing zone, pick your spots course, but distance does make your approaches a lot shorter and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. other thing that's interesting is it looks like Evelina is not going to be here. Yeah. According to the registration sh- yeah. uh, sheet. So, who knows when she'll make her return back for the playoffs Probably and stuff, for the but playoffs, yeah. um, it's just interesting to be over here, travel back, and hopefully she's returning. So, as we get into our predictions, I have officially taken the lead. I'm at 101 points. Trevor's at 100 points. I think I literally have had the lead since like probably one of the first weeks. Yeah, it was like you and Joe were back and forth, it's and I haven't crazy. been in. Crazy. Yeah, so yeah. Worlds did me good. Really, my Dark Horse pick, and I think my Dark Horse pick's going to do me good again this week. Uh, but probably right. MPO, I'll kick it off. I'm taking Simon Lazat to win. Wow. Yeah, I'm going Simon Lazat win, wow. Gannon Burr in second, and of course, I got to do it, Mr. Robot Chicken third, Chris Dickerson. That's a risky one because, like, that could obviously pay That's off. That's a risky great, top three. But, like, one and three could just not be Very risky top there. three. I wouldn't say mine is super safe, but I definitely went with three names that sound chalk. Um, I have Gannon Burr taking third. I took, I'm going to take AB in second. I feel like this is going to be another one of his his pop up events where he plays really well. And then I think Calvin Heimberg is going to win this one. Okay. Um, I really, really like. I, I I feel like Calvin Heimberg would be my top three like lock. Like I I really feel good about him on this. one. I like that. Now, what's your FPO looking like? FPO. I'm going to take Owen Scoggins in third, Holland Hanley in second, and then Kristen to win. I don't love that, but I just feel like it's still probability. So I had to do it. I'm taking Own Scoggins to win. I'm actually going to go with Missy Gannon in second, mm. and then I'm putting Kristen in third. Okay, a lot of chances for some shakeups. Uh, final thing, the dark horse. I don't know how this is available, but it is. He's in 44th in the Pro Tour standings. Give me this Sir Kevin Jones. First half of the season stunk. That's a yeah. That that probably is going to be impossible to beat. The only man that can do it is Ezra Aderholt. He's outside the top 30. 33. Wow, and this is electric. What, then. See, the reason I like the Ezra pick is because he's right on the bubble, so he's yeah. playing for a lot. Well, this is also... Like KJ technically is, too. Like Maybe a win or something could probably jump him in, but like, well, this being is also one of the first. I feel like this is one of the first weeks either of our Dark Horse picks could legitimately be on like lead card. Ezra could legitimately win. And you, well, KJ could legitimately win. Yeah, but Ezra, I, I, Ezra... He's got better history here. I feel like Ezra's more likely to win... I disagree. Than Kevin Jones. I disagree. I think Kevin Jones is more likely to perform better. I don't well, I don't know if I disagree. But I think Ezra's more likely to win. <laughs> yeah. I don't if know. what I'm saying makes sense. I don't know. But it'll be interesting to see. Well, you can find out too by watching on the Disc Golf Network. And don't forget to use code FDG10 to get yourself 10% off your first month of Standard or Pro. And if you want to go ahead and sign up for that yearly membership, use code FDG20 to get yourself 20% off your Standard or Pro annual membership. Um, and if you're like, hey, I don't really want to watch any of that, I don't really care. Well, we'll tell you all about it on Grip Locked on Monday, so you can just wait and tune into then as well. Either way, we'll talk to you Monday and recap everything that went down at the Discraft Great Lakes Open.